Pray with me. Dear Jesus, our master and our friend, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your glory. Amen. Well, right at the end of my internship, they finally gave this Baptist boy a chance in the pulpit. So y'all need to hold on. We're going to have about 45 minutes. Today is the feast of the transfiguration of Jesus. In our second reading today, Peter says that he is using his dying breath to tell us about this moment in his life with Jesus, about the transfiguration. Why does this event matter so much to Peter? First, who's here is a a Boy Scout? Raise your hand. I'm an Eagle Scout, and on the way to that, I spent uh, two treks over in Philmont. Philmont is this massive ranch out in New Mexico that an oil tycoon, Wade Phillips, donated to the Scouts back in the 30s. So it's a big thing to go over there for a trek. And a highlight of every trek is hiking up Mount Baldy, the tallest point in the ranch, about 12 and a half thousand feet. And it takes all day to get up and down. Well, my first time up, we made it past the tree line and eventually all the way up to the summit and it was all clouds. You couldn't see a thing. It felt like all that climbing with all that weight on our backs was for nothing. We were dejected. But I was the chaplain for the troop at that time, and and I snuck pita bread and Welch's grape juice in at the bottom of my pack and kept it waiting for this glorious moment at the top so we could have communion up there together. And I know, I know, I wasn't a priest, but I wasn't Episcopalian yet. Don't judge me. Well, I swear, I held that bread up, and I broke it. And I kid you not, at the very same moment, the clouds parted. All of a sudden, we could see the vast expanse of the ranch. And from that mountaintop, we basked in the beauty of that magnificent corner of God's creation. It was, I'd say, a divine moment. Have you ever had a moment like that before where it felt like the veil was lifted? And you know, gods do have a habit of showing up on mountaintops. The the gods of the Greeks dwelt on Mount Olympus, and Genghis Khan climbed the highest peaks always to meet with his god, Tengri. And if a landscape is is lacking in mountaintops, the people there construct their own. The Mesopotamians made ziggurats and the Aztecs pyramids, all so they could go up and, and meet with their gods. And so, too, we hear today that the true God meets with his people on mountaintops, And this shouldn't scare us. After all, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the warp and woof of the universe, doesn't it make sense that we'd sometimes stumble into that way, that path, and and we'd rhyme with the truth? So we hear today about Moses ascending Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments from God. Imagine the drama of it all as he is enveloped in the stormy cloud and the blast of the trumpet ringing out. Moses heard God telling him up there, I am not just another God of the mountain. I am, I am the one who is. We also remember God meeting with Elijah on a mountain, not in the whirlwind or the earthquake or the fire, but in the still, small voice. St. Luke tells us that here at the Transfiguration, both of these two holy men, Moses and Elijah, appeared alongside Jesus on the mount. And you know, I figure in this moment, time was condensed. All these mountaintop experiences were actually this one same event. For Peter, James, and John, this moment was 33 AD. But for Moses, it was 1300 BC. And for Elijah, 850 BC. All these great meetings with God on the mountain are actually this one singular event. St. Luke tells us that here at the Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about his exodus, which he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. But how could I say that? Is that how Moses and Elijah experienced it? Don't we know from Exodus that this moment for Elijah was when he was given the law, and from 1 Kings that for 
um, for Moses, where he was given the law, and First Kings, that for Elijah, this is when he was told to overcome the prophets of Baal. We do. But remember, Peter tells us in our second reading today that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. Of course, Moses and Elijah heard what they heard and most likely had no clue what God had in store with Jesus. But this might help. Do you all remember that moment when, after the resurrection, Jesus walks with two disciples on the road to Emmaus? It says that beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. So according to Jesus, the writings of Moses and the prophets are about him. Even when those who wrote them and, and those who have known them intimately all their lives are unable at first to see him there. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul says that even to this day, when the Old Testament is read, a veil covers the hearts of those who don't know to look for Jesus there. So things are not always as they appear. Sometimes they are veiled. Underneath what our human eyes see, deeper truths are often hidden from view. The transfiguration is not a moment when Jesus becomes something that he was not already. No, it's, it's a moment of revelation. It's a life-changing event where the veil between heaven and earth is lifted. As I said earlier, other cultures might be able to say many good, true, and, and beautiful things about God. The Greeks, for example, like most of the world's deeper religious traditions, were able, at least in their philosophy, to say many true things about God. But the one God, we inherited a great deal of their language about God in the church's early years. They knew, the Greeks, about a God who was unchanging, all-knowing, eternal, who was the good, the true, and the beautiful. But Greek philosophy could not conceive that such a God would take frail flesh and die. Jesus both preserved and overturned the hopes and fears of the ancients who yearned for a vision of God's face on the mountaintop. Again, St. Luke tells us that what Jesus and Moses and Elijah were discussing was his exodus in Jerusalem, that they were conversing about Jesus' impending crucifixion and resurrection. This brilliant God-man, this dazzling deity here on the mountaintop is the same one who for our sakes will be whipped and mocked and lynched on a tree. The vision of Jesus' glory here is to make plain from what heights he comes to descend into such depths. God gave us a glorious vision of himself, yes, the visible image of the invisible God, as Paul says. But he gave us a glimpse only visible in the face of a crucified peasant. And so in the face of every neighbor who demands our love. God most fully showed what it meant to be God, not so much in this moment of dazzling glory on the mount, nor by being almighty, throwing lightning bolts and smiting sinners, but on the hard wood of the cross in the all too human act of dying. But what in the eyes of the world seemed like defeat was in actual fact Christ's victory over sin and death. Christ was handed over by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. There'll be moments in our lives when, like at the transfiguration, the veil is lifted and we see things as they truly are. But more often than not, we can only perceive reality through the eyes of faith. Knowing that God is at work in all things, that God works all things for the good of those who love him, we can look backwards and forwards to see everything in that light, making everything new. The scriptures by themselves are just printed words on a page. But when we as the body of Christ gather together and read them looking for Jesus, the veil is lifted and they become the very word of God. 
Water on its own is useful for cleaning and drinking. But when we call upon the Holy Spirit and add the word, it's become the washing of regeneration in baptism and children of God are born again. Bread and wine that we bring here are merely the fruit of the earth and, and the work of human hands. But when the Holy Spirit descends upon them, they become also for us the body and blood of Jesus. And you, beloved, so washed and so fed, you are the church of the living God, the very body of Christ. We invoke the Holy Spirit in order to bring to light the full depth and range of the connectedness of the world we're in. We invoke the Spirit in the sacraments so that the things of this world speak as freely as they can to us of that one life that holds them all together and their diversity so that they speak transformingly to us. Then we can hear and see that earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush afire with God. And then so hearing and seeing and loving with the same love that God himself is, we will become, as Peter says earlier in the letter we read from today, partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature nature. Now, though, what do we make of the fact that our human senses are normally so unreliable? Well, Jesus took the disciples up with him. The three he chose, Peter, James, and John, did not ask to accompany him up on the Mount of Transfiguration, nor did they personally have any special qualities or, or characteristics enabling them to see him transfigured. He gives them this vision as pure gift. We oughtn't look to ourselves to make an experience like this happen. God has to give it as a gift. We're told that at the transfiguration, the father says to the disciples, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. What does this Jesus, whom the father claims as his own son, his chosen whom he commands us to listen to, have to say to us. He says, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in thy weakness. He says, come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, behold, I make all things new. These are the words Jesus speaks to you. Can you hear them? For in time, we shall all behold what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Then we will see God face to face like Peter, James, and John. Then we will look on him whom we have pierced. We will see Jesus in all his dazzling splendor. We all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord will be transformed into that same image from glory to glory. In the name of the God who gives us ears to hear and eyes to see, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.